Hello and welcome back to the Book, Business and Brand Building Summit. I'm your host, Jesse Krieger, and today we have a very special guest, perhaps one of the people that I'm most excited about to share with you over the course of this summit. He is the founder of the Art of Charm podcast, which now reaches over 2 million people per month. And he has interviewed and spoke with some of just the leading experts, um, authors, entrepreneurs, literally, on the planet. And uh, I think even Forbes has called him the Charlie Rose of podcasting. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce to everybody, Jordan Harbinger. How are you doing, Jordan? Hey, good. Thanks for having me on, man. It's so funny because uh, I don't know when we met, but I think it was a conference call on a BlackBerry sometime in 2005 or something like that. It was pretty funny. It was. I mean, like, our history goes way back in the day. Um, I think you, would, you had a little bit different focus then, and I was in my whole like dating coach phase mm -hmm. era. And, yeah. uh, and yeah, now look at you, you got a life-size poster of yourself in the background and all I have is a made it when you got a vinyl, a, a vinyl pull-up <laughs> banner. That's right. I need right? to get one of those, uh, just totally horizontal where I'm doing the Burt Reynolds and I'll just put it right back behind me and it'll block off this area right here. <laughs> well, at least you've got the, uh, the Art of Charm branded mic there. I mean, that, that mic has seen some serious action over the years, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, this, this thing is, uh, this thing has got some miles on it, if you can say that about a microphone. And, uh, and I'm proud of it. I'm glad to have it here. I've dropped it. I've lost it. I've probably purchased it, you know, secondhand as it was back in the day and, uh, or, or got it from somebody else. I think it was given to me actually when I worked at Sirius XM and I don't even know if it's the same one. It's kind of one of those things that travels with you for so long. And then you finally realize you can't, you, you can't do without it. It's probably like your first skateboard or something like that. If you're in that whole area, your first I mean, baseball. Yeah, it's become like an integral part of the show, right? I mean, it would be almost yeah. different to do a, do a broadcast without it. Definitely. And I know you do it mostly with audio too. So thanks for joining us for this live video um, broadcast. You get to see actually behind the scenes where all of these, you know, interviews and the art of charm magic takes place. My pleasure, man. You know, I don't, as you can tell, I don't really have the full setup behind me. So I got to figure out, how to, I got to figure out, like I said, the, the background like you've got going on here instead of just the lights that I use when, when the camera's over there. Yeah. Over there. Yeah. Over that way. <laughs> that, right there. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe as we jump off here, um, you know, a lot of people I'm sure have heard of you and perhaps even listened to the Art of Charm podcast, but maybe you can just give a little overview of what you've built with the Art of Charm and, you know, your guys' focus as a podcast. And I know now in the top 50, all podcasts on iTunes, I mean, it's just blown up into a phenomenon, but maybe in your own words, you know, how do you describe the Art of Charm podcast to other people when you meet them for the first time? Sure. Yeah. It's kind of complicated because it's evolved so much over the last decade almost that we've been doing the show. So essentially what I do on the show is I take high performers or to basically pick amazing people's brains, make their wisdom available to everyone is one sort of bumper sticker that we use. Or I teach people new things by interviewing incredible people that already do them or find people who are high performers and have a special skill, help them deconstruct it and teach it to the audience. So there's a lot of different sort of audience dependent bumper stickers or slogans or whatever you might want to label it. And, uh, so we essentially dig into people's minds and mindsets and deconstruct those so that they can teach something to the listening audience. Because there's a lot of shows out there that kind of want to do this where they're like, we've got all these different business people on there, but it's just that person's story and you've got to read between the lines so much that you're not sure what you're looking for. Or it's so basic that it doesn't have any application in your life directly if you've ever read any book on any subject related to that matter. you know. So we try to dig and do a deep dive. And that's why our shows are an hour long. And we'll have somebody on there who's seemingly totally unrelated to human performance, like the former head of the CIA or the former head of the NSA, General Hayden, who we had on last week. And he'll come in and talk about decision-making processes that are important and people go, oh, I get it now, right? Because this is a person whose decisions affect the, the free world, right? Drone strikes and surveillance against American citizens. I mean, these are the decisions that he's making at the policy level. So it's pretty interesting to hear from somebody like that when you're thinking, do I hire this assistant or not? This is the big decision in my life right now. And then you get that same process that maybe somebody like that uses. Or uh, Heinz Ward, former Super Bowl MVP, two-time Super Bowl MVP, came on the show a couple of weeks ago as well and talked about growing up of just being a different ethnicity and pushing through 
things like personal difficulty and racism. And it was just, just runs the whole gamut. But basically, I get to talk to really interesting people and make them tell me stuff they didn't plan on telling me during the show. I love that. And I mean, I'll just speak a little from personal experience. When I had the uh, opportunity to be on Art of Charm podcast, like you were very diligent and, you know, we've even known each other for a while, but you were very mm -hmm. diligent before we actually got into the recording stage about like, what are you going to cover and what's the arc of the conversation and what are listeners going to take away? And, you know, I mean, just speaking as somebody that's been on like 50 plus podcasts is very, very rare. Um, you know, maybe just a small handful of people that have done even close to the amount of pre-interview preparation work that you do. And I think that's perhaps one of the, you know, an initial takeaway for people here that are getting into broadcast or looking to build your audience is like going a little bit below the surface before you bring somebody on or before you feature them. And uh, I think that's just a testament to what you guys are doing. I, I think appreciate it's, uh, it. I think, you know, I have, a, I have a question, you know, with, with a name like the Art of Charm, when somebody like General Hayden, you know, I'd be curious to know, does that, did you approach him and invite him on? Or does somebody like that in the military have any hesitation about going on a podcast called The Art of Charm? Or what is the conversation like to get some of these high level people that you know, may not normally do podcasts or this type of media? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I wish I'd named it something else, but that's the brand we got. We're sticking with it for now. I might name it something else in a few years. If, a no, if I found another name that was just really awesome, I might change the show name, but it's hard, as you know, to name things and come up with great nomenclature that's sticky and also represents your brand and also isn't already taken by someone else. So it's, it's tough. But for us, it started to become less of a problem. Before, it certainly was. You know, oh, what is this? And then people go by their stupid judge a book by its cover impression of what you must be about based on their gut reaction to the words you use in your name. And that's kind of irritating. And, and it happens occasionally where... It, and it's it's funny because it's usually, and you know this from your dating coach days, the guys, in, or I should say the people that tend to be the most rejectionist of the name tend to be guys who are in their 20s and 30s and probably need everything that you and I used to teach back in our early 20s, but they're just refusing to look at it because it makes their ego hurt a little bit. The people who don't care are the celebrities and the hard to gets. Like General Hayden, he replied within minutes and was like, love it. Love the idea. This is such a cool thing. I'm totally in. Uh, we had Heinz Ward. It took five seconds for him to be on board with it. He was totally stoked. But it, you'll get some mid-level internet marketing guy with 10,000 Twitter followers as of yesterday. And he's like, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to vet this. And it's just like, it's so funny to see the the level of self-importance is directly correlated with the amount of trouble we have to go through getting somebody on the show. And we find that the the really big names, the A-listers and stuff like that, that we've got lined up, and I'm not saying like exaggerating A-listers. I mean, people you hear on the radio every time you turn it on, even if you hate that song now, those guys, we have some of those guys lined up, guys and girls lined up coming on the show, and they took minutes days of, of convincing some PR person who said, love this, you guys are doing awesome, the production quality is solid. It's usually not an issue. And I, and I found that to be super interesting because 10 years ago when we started a podcast and nobody knew what it was, I couldn't get anybody to do the show. I'd have some intern with some other company that was only online and they, they would be flaky about coming on the show. Now we routinely get pitched by people, this is his fifth bestseller and he's on a book tour and we're like eh, we don't have time for you right now come back in six months so it, it's kind of funny turning from the ugly duckling when nobody even knew what a duckling was into kind of the hot chick in a lot of ways after 10 years of working hard to build the platform and right now we're using that uh that new look to get bigger and better names on the show so that we can deliver more to the audience yeah. So, I mean, I'm curious, what's the ratio between like, do you have a list somewhere of people that you still want to have on the show that you haven't gotten yet and you're actually doing proactive outreach, like perhaps, um, you know, with General Hayden or other people of his caliber? Or is that also coming inbound now where people are saying, hey, you know, we've been following what you're doing and we think it'd be a great fit, but not people that are like, you know, just getting started or mid mid tier yeah. internet marketers, but real big names yeah. that that you'd actually want to have on the show. Yeah, that 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 happens a lot actually with surprising regularity, and it it taught me an important lesson because, like I'd said before, the the level of like self importance that somebody has is directly correlated with how hard they are to get on the show. So what I found is, it's much more difficult to get 
somebody who just launched a software product or their new ebook or whatever, it's hard. It's harder to get those people than it is to get somebody who's on their third bestseller who knows about your work and knows the other guests on the show. It was harder for us to reach out to a somewhat random niche music artist to interview than it was for us for the same people to reach out the same department of people reached out the same day and said hmm it might be tough for us to get so and so but have you thought about having this guy on your show and i'm like that guy's 10 times more popular than the the guy that i asked for and i didn't even think about asking for it and they're like yeah and we also manage beyonce so you know when her next album comes and i'm just like wait a second i reached out for some niche like Christian rapper guy because I thought he was attainable. I'm not even into, of course, I don't listen to gospel hip hop, man, you know, but I thought it would be an interesting story and he has a good backstory and he wrote a book and he's an interesting cat. And then suddenly they're offering me somebody who, if I had reached out for that person on my own, I would have hit the assistant to the assistant to the assistant's email autoresponder and never seen the light of day. And I thought that was really interesting that your assumptions on who's attainable and who's not tend to be way off. You'll have a harder time booking an, an internet marketer celebrity guy for your show or for your book or for your blog than you will a real actual celebrity with real clout and a real brand behind them. You'll have a harder time because those people exist on the internet and they're in a totally different ecosystem based on totally different value metrics. Whereas a PR person for Beyonce is looking at pure numbers or is looking at the types of, of outlet that you are and they're going to run an experiment with blogs and you just happen to be the guy that emailed that morning after the meeting. You never know. A lot of it's luck and a lot of it is we're looking for pure numbers and they don't worry that my brand, the art of charm is going to taint general Hayden's brand. They're not worried about that, right? He's going to go tough rocks. I don't care what you think about my appearance on art of charm. Whereas somebody who's got a softer brand, who's maybe a little bit less experienced and of course much lower on the, the fame and fortune totem pole, they're going to be much more sensitive to what they perceive as negative branding, whether or not that's an appropriate conclusion or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it, I mean, it brings up a really interesting point um, and, a, and a question. I mean, would you say the people that are higher up that totem pole, it's a function of them just being around long enough and having an appreciation for media and reach and access to an audience? Um, or is there some relationship to people that are like, lower and giving you a harder time, um, you know, just being a little bit green or they still haven't like yeah. been in the industry long enough to, to really see the value in what you guys are doing. There's a little bit of both. So for example, a really non-internet savvy author might say, yeah, I don't know. I don't do podcasts. I don't get it. I'm not into it. And that's fine. And I understand that. And it's that's happening less and less over time, as you might imagine, because now podcasting I think has officially hit the threshold where 25% of America knows what one is or maybe it's half knows what one is and 25% has listened to one in the past 30 days or at least they think they have that's great and that's huge news right and that that's you know, twice as much as the year before or whatever metrics you're looking at on the other hand you get somebody who's been around for a long time like General Hayden and or Heinz Ward who is in the NFL and you think okay, this is a guy who understands there's tons of different media outlets. He's probably digitally savvy in some ways. I mean, he didn't use Twitter and social media when he was in the NFL, and we talked about that on the show, actually. But he realizes there's a whole world out there, and until up and until he sees reason not to do it, if he has time, he's going to do it. Because the, these guys all realize, to a certain extent, and again, depending on how old they are and how long they've been around, that getting a print write up in the San Jose Mercury news is not as good as your appearance on the art of charm or any podcast or five different smaller ones for that matter. But somebody who's 85 years old or 75 years old or somebody who's a PR person straight out of college and doesn't know about digital media because they're not necessarily leveraging it professionally, they might not realize that getting in newspapers in general is kind of a huge waste of time unless it's the five you can name on your fingers that you hear about every day that people read even when they're in other countries, right? So it's an interesting paradigm and you can't look at the age only and you can't look at the amount of time they've been in business only. For me, when I look at getting PR, I, I don't care about 
the outlet as much as I care about certain metrics that I ask about depending on the type of media. And the reason is because people are purposely nowadays, even mainstream media is trying to pull the wool over your eyes about how much reach you're going to get. I got an email. This is a great example that just came to me. I got an email the other day from like some sort of PR firm, right? And most PR firms, complete waste of time. They don't do anything. They just email a Rolodex full of people that maybe somebody replies and then they send out a press release, which just goes into the spam folder of everyone's inbox. And it's, it's basically spam that journalists can't unsubscribe from. It's awful. So nobody reads most of those. And this PR company was like, are you sick of hitting the spam folder? Pay us. You only pay for results. We'll get you in any type of, of, media outlet, including, and it's like Business Insider, Forbes, Inc. And I wrote back and I was like, hey, just out of curiosity, what outlets can you get me in that are not Business Insider, Forbes, or Inc? And they were like, are you kidding? Those are great outlets. And I was like, no, they're not. They used to be great outlets, but now they're basically HuffPo, which, sorry, if you're, if you're not familiar out there and you're listening right now and you're thinking these media outlets sound awesome, you can, if you can spell, you can submit an article to any of these sites and they will publish it. And I don't, I hope I'm not blowing up any of your uh, book promo. Like, no, 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 I love it. Whatever. No, unfiltered. But like you can, you can, and I know you have real stuff that you teach, so I'm just messing with you. But like you, you've got these, this pool of people that just basically think that getting in media is tough. And so they'll sell you access to that. But really all they're doing is now, when print media had a front page, a below the fold, and an inside five pages, all of that real estate was valuable. Now you have infinite real estate other than the front page and above the fold, the home page of every website, Forbes Inc., whatever. Those articles are always written by their own staff. Unless it's something going ridiculously viral that they promote to the front page manually. You write something, it's just going to go in the back of the back of the back of the back. You can write an article for an amazingly huge site like Inc. or Forbes, and you can have triple-digit views. I don't mean shares. I mean views. Hundreds of people and robots, probably half robots, are indexing and looking at that article, or they find it by mistake, or the people that you share it with are the ones that open it. No one is looking at this. So to pay for access to that is completely ludicrous. And now I forget your original question because I went off on a rant. No, it actually is a really good point because I've never personally worked through any of these intermediaries, but I've started to see them pop up like, hey, we, we're a podcast concierge. Yeah. We'll get you on you know, 15 podcasts. And I'm, I'm always curious. It's like, do the people that are running those podcasts know that you're out there shopping their, um, their shows to yeah. people for cash? It, uh, it doesn't make sense to me, and, the, and I've probably wasted, the most money I've ever wasted in business has been on PR. It just doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have a return, and it's for no. the reason you're saying. And for anybody that's listening to this, like, you shouldn't be impressed when he said triple-digit views if you get something into Forbes. Like, hundreds yeah. of people is not moving the needle. And it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. No. Uh, people who get viral content or exist on their content, I just interviewed Tim Urban of Wait But Why. You know that blog? It's, this, it's a really interesting blog that's like, Imagine somebody writing about just exactly how your brain thinks, stream of thought, and then they Google something and go off in a different direction, and then they may draw a stick figure picture. The guy's great, Tim Urban. And uh, he wrote a couple of pieces that are just friggin' genius, and they went viral, and they've got something like 293,000 shares. Imagine how many views that has, just millions and millions and millions and millions. He's got multiple posts in that league, and it takes him you know, weeks to write each one. And it's really good content, really good quality. You just spoke at TED. I mean, this guy's the real deal. And he's like 36, 37 years old. If that's you're looking at, that's a lot of people reading your stuff. Forbes, their entire site, other than the articles that they're writing about that are also in print media, they're not getting that kind of traffic anymore unless you aggregate all of the posts that they have and you add them together. That's the only reason those sites are large anymore. That's why when HuffPo people go, oh, Huffington Post, 20 million views every week or what day or whatever it is. Yeah, across a bajillion articles that have been written by everybody and their uncle that are buried 17 different layers below. And it's just not useful for you. It's not getting you credibility because anybody can go in there. And, and it's not getting you new eyeballs because... People aren't even finishing reading those, let alone clicking the links, clicking the links that are in there in your byline to go to your website. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. It's you'd you'd have better luck 
printing up a bunch of flyers, going to a shopping mall and throwing them up in the air. And before the janitor cleaned them up, maybe one or two people would pick one up. And of those people, one of them would put it in their pocket. <laughs> and maybe they would go to your website later when they got home, but probably not. You'd have probably equal conversion from that. I mean, that's so funny. I mean, do you think it's gotten more? Well, let me ask you, actually ask this, because I heard Tim Ferriss mention something that blew my mind. You know, he's got three legitimate best-selling books. I think they're all New York Times bestseller. But he said, you know, since he started his podcast, he's had more people come up to him on the street, talk to him, like more overall response from his podcast than all three of his books combined. And those books were like, no joke. I mean, yeah. our work, we changed my life. So do you think that's an accurate representation of the, the reach and, and power of podcasting? Um, and what is, you know, your experience with your own reach and how that really, you know, moves the needle for people that come on your show, but also, you know, now you're in the, the driver's seat of a media outlet that has a massive reach. Like, what, what's your perspective on the lay of the land uh, media wise in terms of podcasting, yeah. but also with the changing nature of these other online print publications? Sure. Look at it this way. And this is something I've, I've always kind of struggled to explain. You've read, you read a lot, right? You read tons of books, you publish tons of, if you ran into the author of a book you read last week, would you even recognize him? You probably wouldn't have any idea what he looks like. And people that I interview on the show and stuff like that, I, I look their, I look up their picture when I read their book and I look at different media that they produce. But most people don't do that because they're not studying the book. They're just reading it. And if you listen to an audio book and it's narrated by the author, you get that little angle from them, right? So imagine it like you've, you've sold a book and somebody read part of it three years ago. They don't remember you. They just, they don't. But if you listen to the Art of Charm or the Tim Ferriss show or the, you know, the Art of Charm podcast, for example, which has been going for almost 10 years now, you've heard my voice multiple times per week for as long as you've been listening. And that's only if you're listening to the new stuff. If you're trying to catch up, like a lot of people do who found me a year ago or, or so, I get emails every day from people that are like, yeah, I drive a lot, or I work in an office where I'm allowed to wear headphones, or I work out a lot, whatever it is, I run. So there are people that listen to me for two, three, six hours a day, every day. Now, when that person, I've, this happened to me at EDC. We were just talking about EDC in Vegas. I was standing in line and somebody said, are you Jordan Harbinger? And I said, how did you recognize me? And one of the guys was like, I recognize your voice because <laughs> I've listened to it for years. And this is in a line with 140,000 people. Now, you can write a book, but it doesn't matter because even if you say, yes, I wrote this book and it was a bestseller and people go, oh, I read that. They don't remember you. They can't associate it emotionally. It's just content. It's words on a page. Voice is totally different. It speaks to a different part of your brain. It's held in a different part of memory. A lot of people are auditory. People who are great at reading are good at studying. Maybe they're visual, but it's unlikely that they're able to visualize or that they're even bothering to visualize the author. So there's a lot of brain science at work here as well. And that's why you see people who are on YouTube a lot. They have the, a lot of good visual recognition, but they have a lot of shallow interaction. So the video might be two minutes long and people go, oh, that's that guy from YouTube. I knew you looked familiar. But it's not, this is my friend that I know. This is a person that I know from YouTube because it's too shallow. Books are very, very, very deep, but they're totally divorced from the personality angle of the person. Podcasting is very different. It's a long format. You're listening to me for an hour, hour and a half, and that's one show. If you're listening to Tim, you're listening for two, two and a half hours. That's one show. You're hearing the voice. You're hearing how I interact with people. You know how I talk with my friends. You know how I talk in certain situations. You know what kind of jokes I make. You know what I think is funny. All that stuff you're familiar with. So people know me better than a lot of my actual in-person friends that I've only known for a few months because they've listened to me collectively for far longer than those people have. And that doesn't That's happen with books. Yeah, well, no, it's fascinating. I mean, the whole premise of this summit is, you know, is the book business and brand building summit, it's really how do you leverage your book to go beyond just getting additional readers, but moving into, you know, on the brand building side, getting in media and getting out there and getting people to know you outside of the pages in between the covers, but also, you know, how you leverage a book to build your business and drive into, um, and we've had other presenters that have built live event businesses and so forth um, on the back of their books. And that's totally valid as well. But I think the, the thing that I'm really interested in uh, in getting your perspective on is you know how do 
authors nowadays? How do you know entrepreneurs that are getting started get onto media, get in front of not, not necessarily you um, if they're just getting started, but you know, it seems like in, in one sense, if Forbes and Entrepreneur have now expanded out to just include anybody that submits and becomes As a, a guest contributor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's like the bar has been lowered, but it's also become so diffuse that people aren't really paying attention. And I think you rightly pointed out, you know, with podcasting in a long form format, you really get to know um, both the person that's being interviewed, but more so the host who's on every single show. I, you know, it's also been my experience. I don't actually run a podcast, but when somebody discovers, say, your show for the first time, then goes back and listens to like hundreds and hundreds of episodes that the uh, chronology of the content is different than you find in a newspaper or in a, an online publication. And there's a, a well-marked path that people can follow, see your own development and um, yes. ultimately come up to the, to the present. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, there's a lot of people, that, there's a few things there. There's a lot of people that will also really feel kinship with you when you do certain forms of media because they grow with you. You know, if somebody listens to the show and they, they discover it and then they go back and start from the beginning or they go backwards, a lot of people are like, whoa, look at the development you've had as a brand. Look at the development you've had as a business and as a person. It's really inspiring. And that's, that's what builds a lot of fanship. It's easy to write a book and say, I've made it. Here's what you need to do. And a lot of people do that, but you're not going to build that kinship that you would if you had a different media outlet as well. And I, 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 I'm not recommending podcasting. I think it's a terrible way to make money. It's a lot of work. Um, you can't fake it. Like if you write a blog and you've got a bunch of employees and you decide to scale, you hire more and you hire more, more writers and you're good. Podcasting, you've got to show up. YouTube, you've got to show up and you've got to be good at it. If you're not good at it, there's too much competition. So you look at somebody who's already a celebrity and their show will make it whether or not they're good. If you look at somebody who's not a celebrity and they're not necessarily good at it, there's too much competition for people to stick around. We got lucky because in the beginning there weren't that many shows and there certainly weren't shows talking about the topics that we were discussing. And so since there wasn't that, people were willing to put up with a little bit more two guys in their garage feel. Now people expect radio. They expect radio. They expect you to be good at it. They expect regularity. They expect a lot of that from you. And there's certain exceptions to that rule, but it does matter. It matters a lot. And so you, you, you really need to have multiple angles. If you're doing the book thing and you've published a book, you can't hide behind Twitter and email and, and, and just do that. You can if you're Robert Greene. You know, people get it. They don't care if he's on Twitter, right? They're waiting for the next book to come out. They love him. That's his thing. He's built up enough cachet to do that. If you're a new author, though, you have to be on YouTube and Periscope and all these different media outlets until you find something that you enjoy and that you're good at because that is what helps you engage with the fans. And if you're not doing that, you're just a guy who wrote a book two years ago. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really good advice for everybody that's listening. I hope you take that to heart. Like writing the book and then getting it out, of course, that's a big milestone, but in the other, on the other hand, you know, that's the first day of your lifelong journey of being yeah. the author of that book in a public space. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons I was super excited to have you on, Jordan, is because, you know, for me personally, podcasts have been one of the best avenues I've had to get the word out about lifestyle entrepreneur and now ultimately with the publishing work I'm doing. But I'm also very clear that it's in line with my own personality, which is one where I like this sort of freeform discussion. I like interview format and I know it's not for for everybody but I want to encourage the people that are watching this and listening to this to get aware of what media outlets are in your industry in your space and start to become cognizant of the lay of the land so that you can ultimately um, sort of stair step your way up to getting on some of these bigger shows because you know if you get a feature like after our interview came out and I think it was just on the website you're like uh, a few days later over 30,000 people had listened to our interview and people are emailing me and I'm, you know, still to this day, uh, every occasionally somebody will write me and be like, oh, dude, I just listened to your interview on the Art of Charm and it was so cool. I learned X, Y, and Z. So the longevity of the benefit from getting onto these larger outlets, podcasts in particular, um, is so good. It's so positive. So, I mean, what would you recommend for authors, for entrepreneurs that are listening to start their journey um, getting onto these podcasts and getting onto media because I know you can't just start from like, oh, I've got a book and it's out right. now. Book me on every one of the biggest shows out there. Please. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And I get pitches every single day that are just 
so off-putting. There, you know, there's that line between like hustling and asking for something because you're hoping to shoot for the stars, and then just outright ignorance that makes you, that makes people like me that I, I feel almost dickish saying this, and I and it makes me feel like a bad person in a way for doing it. But there's a list that we keep where when people annoy us by doing certain things, they go on it, and it's the difference between an innocent mistake like, hey, Jordan, you know, I started this business where I sell vitamins, you know, fish oil. Um, is that a fit for your show? It's okay to be to say that. And I'm like, no, it clearly, you haven't really done your homework, but it doesn't really matter if I'm already cool with you for some other reason, right? It doesn't matter. But if, if I'm talking with somebody and they add me on Facebook because they see we have a bunch of mutual friends and then they're like, yeah, I don't know what you do, but, um, I'd love to come on and talk about my book. And I'm like, well, what is it about? You know? And they can't even be bothered to appropriately pitch. They just email me a copy of it. Like I'm going to read it. There's certain red flags that I get from new authors, especially that just basically they tattoo on your forehead. I don't get it. I'm just going to be annoying. And I always blacklist those people. And that doesn't mean, you know, I'm never going to talk to you again, but it does mean my producer will ignore you for at least a year, probably more like three years because there's too many of those coming in. And so what you should do, the first bit of advice I would say is don't worry about the return on your investment of time in terms of reaching that many people because it's kind of like, hey, I should take singing lessons. Why don't I go on America's Got Talent and start there? You would never do that, right? You, you have to learn how to do these things first. So go on all of these tiny podcasts. Do like 50. And it's going to take you a ton of time. Maybe, maybe 50 is a lot. Maybe start with 25. And don't worry about anything about what their audience is like. As long as it's somewhat in your niche, do it. And as long as they've got 10, 20 episodes up, do it. The reason is because you'll reach a few hundred or a few thousand people doing that. You can do that. Do it even if you can, ideally before your book is hard launching, do it on the soft launch. What this will do is it'll teach you how to get interviewed. You'll get your sound bites down because there's nothing worse than having somebody on and you say, tell us what you do. Tell us how we do this in real life. How would you apply this? How would you teach somebody else this? And they have no idea because they've never verbalized it ever. It makes for a terrible show. I don't even, we, we have a pre-interview call where if my producer's talking with you before you come on the show and you do stuff like that, he just says, sure, let's circle back in eight months because we're just waiting for you to get the practice. I'm not willing to be your your practice dummy, your tackling dummy. I, I want your A game the second you step on the field at AOC. And I've earned that right over a decade, right? So I want somebody who's done 25, 40, 50, 100 hours of other media so that when they come on, I just go, tell us what you do in one sentence. Well, dot, dot, dot. Cool. What can you teach our audience? A, B, and C. Well, let's break down A. Sure. Here are the five pillars of A. Here are the three pillars of B. And C works this way, and sometimes it works that way. Then I can take things and... and try to play the shell game with them and move things around and have them work a little harder and it's fun and they enjoy it. If I'm trying to just get you to articulate your own content, ugh, it's awful. And that doesn't make you look good. It doesn't sell books. It doesn't sell your brand. So you need to get on and do as many shows as humanly possible before you start pitching bigger shows. And frankly, I wouldn't even expect your first book to hit bigger shows. It's very unlikely and it's kind of asking a lot. You know, you should not think that because you wrote a book last month, you're going to be up next to Ryan Holiday, who's written, I think, 15 bestsellers or something like that. It's just not going to happen. And that's okay. Well, I guess my question is, is the book even the appropriate angle? Um, sure, you, you've got a book coming out, you're an author, you're excited about yeah. that. But are you more compelled to engage with somebody if they've got you know an idea or something that's practical that people have put into uh, use in their own life and gotten great results out of, as opposed to just being like, my next book is coming out. Can I be on your show? Right. Yeah, that's a great question and a great point. I'd rather have somebody who doesn't necessarily have a book coming out. And there's multiple reasons for this. One, if you have a book coming out, it's great because you've articulated your points. However, you're probably also on a book tour and you're going on as many media outlets as you can, which means that for me, you're played out. So I will probably make you wait six to eight months or I'll record the show now and I'll, I'll just won't, I just won't release it for six to eight months because I don't want to be releasing a show with everybody else, especially podcasters, because those guys are just going to release, you're going to release 40 of the same guy on your show and I'm supposed to deal with that. People are going to skip it. I don't need to deal with that hassle. I don't want to get buried in those search results. I, I also expect a little bit of cross promo, which you can't provide if you're doing a book tour because you're 
just doing too much stuff. So I'd rather have the athlete come on after they've won an event a few years later or something like that. And before they've written their book about it, hmm. I'd rather have that. That's the magic window. So I don't, because it's, is that an exclusivity thing? Like, it's like exclusivity you're not thing. on a book tour so that, you know, there's not 20 interviews coming out in a one right. month period. It is. Yeah. That's an exclusivity thing. The other reason that I like doing it when there's not a book on, on the shelf is because I want your ideas. I don't want your spiel. I don't want the same content that you've given a lot of other people. I'm going to probably read the book or whatever other content you've created, and I'm going to synthesize it myself and make you teach us something. And I don't want the same things that you've taught in other areas, and I probably don't really care what's in the book. I want your story, and your story may be in the book, but I want you to talk about it. I don't just want the content from the book on the podcast. That's not interesting because if you read the book, you don't need to listen to the show. People listen to Art of Charm because they want a deeper dive with the author of that book. You don't have to have a book to do a deep dive into somebody's life. Right? Well, I think there's a great takeaway for the listeners and more than one, but one in particular is like, sure, you've gone through the work, you've gotten your book done, and it's a structured piece of content that presents your ideas, hopefully some outcomes and benefits that people can realize if you're writing a nonfiction. But then when you go on media, listen and take to heart what Jordan's saying. If you can't say in one sentence, what's your book about? Who is it for? And how is it going to help them? And be able to articulate beyond just, you know, one or two sentences that you've pre-scripted, but really going into depth, like he showed, you know, there's A, B, and C, and in A, there's five considerations, and in B, sometimes it's like this. That's actual interview-ready content, and that's sort of where you need to get to in order to be interesting uh, when you do get booked on some of these shows so that people keep listening, right? I mean, exactly. if it's on and they're lame, then you can always just turn it off, and that's yep. the power everybody has as a consumer of media. Um, it is. And, and the other the other reason that I don't love first time authors is because a lot of times there's an expectation that they're going to write a book, lean on that platform, and that's all they're, they're going to coast on that for a decade. I want somebody who's got so much content that people can continually deep dive into what they're doing or the content is so novel that it's really interesting. General Hayden, for example, he didn't have a lot of books in his past, but he was the head of the NSA and the CIA. We didn't necessarily talk about, so when you were writing this book in Cape Cod, I mean, that was not the focus. The focus was what's going through your head when you're about to authorize a drone strike and the guy's got his grandson in his lap, right? What's going through your head when you realize that we're collecting metadata on millions of Americans' phone calls and that maybe somewhere down the line, this is going to be marked as non-constitutional. You're going to be a villain. What are you thinking? Are you worried about that? Things like that. He can answer that as a person. It doesn't really depend on the book. And I think a lot of people go, oh, they see the book as like this hurdle, this obstacle that they've got to get out of the way so that they can be an expert. And that's backwards. I know that a lot of people look at it th that way, but you write a book because you're an expert. You don't write a book so that you can prove, so that it's a business card that says you're an expert. If you're in fitness or something like that, what have you done besides write a book? That's what I'm asking. And if the answer is, well, I just wrote a book, well, okay, are you an exercise physiologist PhD that's come up with something brand new and that's why you wrote a book? Well, no. Uh, okay, so what you're telling me is that you're a fly-by-night personal trainer correspondence course graduate that wrote a book about stretching and it's not different than any other book, but it's got a, you know, it's got your face on the inside cover. Why should I give a crap? And the, the reason that I don't ever go for that is because so many authors and not even just authors, just people promoting things in general, they're not thinking about what's in it for the audience. I, my job as, as Jordan Harbinger host of the art of charm, my only job is to think about what's in it for the audience. So if you're not thinking about the same thing as me, I am definitely not going to have you on the show. And if you do somehow slip through the filters, you are going to look terrible and you're going to unsell your brand for every thought leader and every consumer that's listening to the show. And that's millions of people that are going to be affected by negative branding. So it's actually bad for you to go on big shows. If you're not ready, it's like going on the voice when you're learning how to sing, you're going to end up, a freaking joke. Remember that guy, William Hung, the Asian guy who couldn't sing and he kept. But doing we, still, the, we still remember his name. Yeah, I don't even watch bang, the show, but I know who bang. the guy is. You right? know that guy? Yeah. I mean, look, he was so bad that people know who he is, 
But do you want to be known for that? Or do you just, would you rather be forgotten like everybody else on that yeah, show? He, does, he can't even be forgotten. He was no. so bad, right? He was so bad, he's not even forgotten. You, that's, that's the worst case scenario for you. But it can happen. You can get guests on that are so bad that big shows that you're on will say, screw it, I'm going to air this because it's so ridiculous. It's a classic example of what not to do. And there are shows like that that I've aired in the past where somebody's so bad, I just let them unsell their brand and their product. You don't want to be in that position because the thing is, when it's happening, you don't know it until later. And you don't own that content. So if you come on my show and you stink it up and then three years later you go, wow, I, what was I thinking? Can you delete that? No, I'm not going to delete it. It's mine. It's my show. People are downloading it and listening to it. I paid for the hosting. I paid for the production. I spent time in it. No, I'm probably not going to delete that. Like, look, if you make yourself look terrible and it's a disaster, I'm not a bad person. I'll probably get rid of it and bury it for you because it's not good for either of us. But if it's good for me and, and you don't like it, it's not your best work, that's your fault. No, no media company is going to delete something you don't like. It's unreasonable yeah. to even ask. Uh, there's really there's two real important points I want to tease out there. Is one, you know, if you're an author, if you're in, uh, somebody who's looking to get on media, don't think about how can I get Jordan's attention so I can be on the Art of Charm. Think about how you can add value to his audience, right? And how you can add value to the listenership. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's not just true for you, but I think that's true for almost any. Yeah, any media, right? It's not the person. It's not the host necessarily. They're the conduit. They're the one bringing you on and giving you the the platform and the exposure. But ultimately, who are you talking to and for? You're talking to the listeners. So you know, if you always keep it focused on what are the outcomes, the benefits, the new perspectives, the value that they're going to gain, the listeners, that is, then you know, would that make you much more uh, interested in having somebody on the show instead of they're just trying to like build rapport and hit you from every different angle and yeah. try and get in your head. Yeah, there's there's a couple common mistakes that I see and only new authors seem to make these because a lot of experienced authors are so into the content and the discussion that they don't even think about it anymore or they're well-trained. It could be either one. For example, going back to General Hayden, right? Just because he's a recent guy who's a really big sort of popular author and a well-known person in America. General Hayden came on and at the end of the show, he goes, oh shoot, we didn't mention the book. And I was like, oh no, we'll take care of that in our, our show close and in our intro, we're gonna have the title, we'll have it linked in the show notes, it's all fine. And he's like, oh good, right? Because he didn't spend the whole time going, in my book, Playing to the Edge by General Michael Hayden, how terrorism, blah, 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 the future, of the like that never came up, ever. But what I see with a lot of new authors and bless them, they're just trying to sell their stuff, and I totally get it, is they do things like, well, in my book, one size does not fit all, which I see behind you there. I talk about this and that and the other thing, but then in my earlier work, Dream Training, available at Amazon, amazon.com slash dream training slash discount slash 10% off out of charm, I talk about how some people don't even know about their own training regimen, and it's just like, wait a minute, dude. You're clearly now not thinking about the audience. You're only thinking about yourself. That breaks the flow of the conversation. Look, if you're so interesting that people are like, I can't believe that conversation that was so good. Who is this guy? They're going to find your book because I'm going to link it in the show notes anyway. People are going to know your name. They're going to Google you. The first result is going to be your book or your website or the Amazon result for your book or your product. You don't have to mention it more than a once or twice in the beginning or the end. And even then, the host should do that. The more you mention your product beyond once or twice, the more obnoxious you are and it sounds terribly salesy. It's really, really bad. And I remember, and I can count on one hand, thankfully, the amount of authors and people that have said things like, and you and I have a mutual friend, one guy did this his first time, said, well, if you go to, uh, and it's, I'll just use your name because I don't want to out anybody. If you go to jessiekrieger.com slash summit slash Jordan, you'll find the cheat sheet for this. And if you go to jessiekrieger.com slash lifestyle press slash discounts slash books, you'll find a full list of all the, and nobody's writing this down. People are listening on the go. They're not listening in their office. Most likely 67% of the consumption of shows like mine are mobile, right? They're not looking at the website. They don't need to hear it from you. It's bad credibility. It's like the dating stuff we used to teach when we were ki kids, right? If you say something cool about yourself, it sounds terrible. If your friend says something cool about you, it's okay. If a stranger says something great about you, it's much more credible. Allow that to happen. Good media will let that, that, will let that happen. You don't have to put 
accolades on yourself. It's silly and it makes you look like a dip. I love that. And that's, it's counterintuitive, right? Because you know, if you're an author out there, you've spent so much time writing your book, you, you finally got the opportunity to share your, your message and tell people about your book on a media outlet. And yet, if you take Jordan's advice to heart, you should let the host be the one that draws that out of you. Or in, in my experience with just one or two exceptions where it was like specifically book content related on the podcast, we're just having a conversation and you know, in this case, the roles would be reversed and somebody's asking me questions and, and I'm sharing like strategies or stories or whatever. And then at the end, you just book note it or you bookend it with, uh, with a mention of the book and where you can find it. Or, or of course, you know, getting linked up in the show notes is actually gonna be more valuable for the same reason you just pointed out because people are listening in their headphones or in their car, they're walking, not sitting there. Oh wait, what was that URL again? Let me dial that back. Uh, a couple seconds so I can catch it. Right. But if somebody's interested enough, or if the person has a compelling enough personality, then it's like a, a magnet. People being like, oh man, I gotta write that down so I can look that up later. So it really does come back to being interesting and having compelling perspectives to share more so than it does, you know, shilling your book and just being there as um, you know, your own your own best salesman, so to speak. It, exactly. And that goes back to doing 50 interviews before you even get to the big house right to, to the Super Bowl. Because if you do those 40, 50 interviews beforehand, it's gonna take you a long time. It's not something you're gonna do in a week or a month. Um, you might It might even take you six months or a year to do that, but that's okay because then you come out shining and you know how to run it and you know what stories hit and you know what makes you sound interesting and you know how to reply to criticism or to challenges or to, you also know how to tailor your message to a certain audience. If somebody comes on and the art of charm and starts talking about uh, weight loss for middle-aged women. Look, there are some middle-aged women that listen to the show. There are thousands, I'm sure, but that's not the core demographic. It's not going to be a great example that you're letting us have for this. But if you go on a fitness show that's led by a middle-aged female and you have that same example, you're probably going to kill it. So you need to be able to research the demographics, look at who's interviewing you and tailor it to that. And that comes after you know your own stuff like the back of your hand. Just because you wrote a book on it does not mean you know how to present it in a live radio format. It almost surely means that you do not know how to do that. There's no reason that you would know a bunch of academic information about a topic and be able to translate it into something that's compelling verbally. It's almost impossible. It's even harder than doing it in a talk on stage because in a talk on stage, you can have a list of bullets that come from your table of contents that you then flesh out and discuss. You rehearse, it takes an hour, good, you got an hour long talk. When you're on the radio, you don't have notes in front of you and if you do, I might say, I, uh, enough about that thing. Let's go talk about this thing that you did three years ago. Now we're off book, are you screwed? If so, you need more practice. That is such a good point because in almost in many other formats, like speaking on a stage, obviously writing a book, other things where you're in control of the message and then there's yep. an audience that's listening to you, it is very different than having a host who can steer the conversation or basically, as Jordan just said, cut you off and change the subject. Does that throw you off your game? Or are you like, does that get your attention and make you even more tuned in to what's going on? If the latter is the case, then you're gonna be an interesting personality to have yes. on shows. And, um, and it's an interesting point that with podcasting and with radio, um, that it's two directional, right? It's not just like, here's the platform now, use it, share your message with the world. And, exactly, um, yeah, and, and you can't, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, in that sense, do you see yourself um, as something of like a, a gatekeeper or a moderator? Like what, in your own mind, how do you think of your role on the podcast interacting with guests and also knowing your audience and being you know positioned right in between them so i'm kind of like a tour guide who's also driving the bus right my producer might actually be driving the bus technically so you know for safety purposes but uh i'm actually in control of the whole conversation and the idea is you let it feel like the guest has some semblance of control over the conversation but truthfully I'm in control of everything that gets done on the show. And that takes years of practice. So there are some personalities that go, oh, I don't know. I don't, I know I'm an interesting, strong personality. And what they do is they try to shoehorn their personality into the personality of my show. And that doesn't work because I'm controlling the flow of the show. Some newbie level podcasters won't know how to do that. And they will let you bowl them over. It doesn't look or sound as flattering as you think it does in the moment. 
it's very problematic. You might think, wow, you know, I just went through there and delivered my message and it came out so powerful. It just looks like you talked over the host the whole time, which, which is funny because we just started this thread by talking over each other. But it takes a lot of practice. A host has to figure out how to let you talk so that it looks like you're able to take your turn and that you have some semblance of control. But really, I'm, I'm leading the way. And a good host will do that. And if you can, if you try to fight me on that, I'm going to have to forcibly shut you down, which is really embarrassing for you. And I will do that. And that, that's something you will work out of yourself with practice. You know, there's people who are really, really good at being interviewed and they're very good at knowing when to let the host jump in and also what to do if they do get shut down. They can, there's a lot of little techniques and things that people can do to get interviewed and be better at it. And there's all kinds of things that hosts can do that, that we learn probably just through practice, but that I can teach as well. But the truth is you really do need the practice. If you think you're not very good at presenting your content, you need the practice. If you think you're great at presenting the content, you're probably not nearly as good as you think you are. You you just think you're good at it because you gave a talk on it or you've given talks on it for years. But if you haven't done live radio where somebody is interviewing you, being the host of your own show doesn't count. If somebody's interviewing you, if you don't have hours and hours of reps, you are not going to be good at it. You just think you are and you will look bad. Yeah. I, I will one, take that to heart, everybody that's watching this now. And two, take it as a fun challenge, right? You don't want to be on a huge show for your first or second interview for many of the reasons that Jordan mentioned because it ultimately will end up reflecting poorly back onto you. Mm -hmm. But look at it as a fun challenge. I mean, I did maybe two dozen interviews that were tangentially related to lifestyle entrepreneur before I went on Entrepreneur on Fire and then probably another 15 more or 20 more before um, you know, I was ever on the Art of Charm. And you know, it's interesting now being on the other side of the mic, uh, I feel like as you're talking, I realize how I've sort of honed my message when I'm being interviewed. It's so different to be like facilitating the conversation. And it's, it's quite frankly something I'm still wrapping my head around as well, not being a podcast host and not necessarily being the media um, personality. But, uh, but you know, I guess just take that as a fun challenge and start, I don't want to say start at the bottom, but start with what's manageable, right? Start with the outlets that are excited to have you on and are enthusiastic about the opportunity. In in this game, you know, with more and more podcasts, with more and more online media, there's no shortage of outlets and they all survive on content, which you as an author are uniquely positioned to deliver if you can do it in a compelling way, if you can do it in an interesting way. There's no shortage of people that want to have you. And before you know it, if you're working that process, then one day, hey, you're on a show that has a huge reach and it really moves the needle and you're ready for it, um, which is preparation meeting opportunity. And I think that's really where you want to wind up. And it's through what Jordan's describing here of like working your way up and honing your craft and getting a sensibility for the medium, right? It's different than speaking on stage or writing in a blog or something of that nature. And, it, and it's more powerful than that. We know that, right, from, from seeing the success of podcasts recently. We know that it's a more powerful medium. So you should be getting good at it in the meantime. And you're right. It is, it, I'm not trying to scare everyone off from doing it. It is a fun challenge. Look, back in the day, you had to pay tens of thousands of dollars for media training so that when you did finally go on the, the Today Show or the radio show, you didn't blow it. Now you've got tens of thousands of podcasts that will have you on via Skype in your pajamas for free and give you a workout as many times a day as you can possibly spare over every day for the next X number of years, drilling you and interviewing you until you've got your stuff down so freaking cold that you can recite it in your sleep. It's free and you get to meet people while you're doing it. You get to connect with people. They get to promote you. So you get to start off that way. And then by the time, yeah, by the time you're ready with your next piece of work for bigger runs of shows, you can say, look, I've already sold X numbers of this. Here's my outline. Here's what I plan to present. Here's how I've done the homework on the show. It's a great challenge. And it means that when you do get a crack at the limelight on a larger show, you're going to be so ready. You and that host are going to love the interaction. And what that means is if you come on Art of Charm and you kill it once, I would love to have you back when you have your next book out. I don't even need you to fill out the stupid form. Right, You don't have to go through XYZ channel. You don't have to jump through a bunch of different hoops. You can come on again because we had a great time and I know your work is quality and it's interesting. That's great because then, of course, you can say, hey, I'd love to get on this other show, Jordan. Do you know this guy? Now you're making the rounds. 
but you can only do it if you build something. And too many people these days, they don't want to do the work to build or get good at a craft. They just want the brand so they can get a blue check mark next to them on Twitter. And then they can go brag around the internet about their new Amazon deal or whatever it is that you've got. And it's just, it's not going to keep working that way because the bar is too low. There's no barrier to entry for blowing hot air up other people's butts. You know, you've got to be good at something. And if you're not, well, you know, you, you'll fade into oblivion. And the, the beautiful part is that getting good at something takes time. So all you have to do is stick it out. You don't have to be especially talented. And people who listen to AOC know what the science says on brain science says on talent and hard work and things like that. All you need to do is keep going. Most people won't. So it's really good news for those of us that have good work ethic and are dedicated to a craft and aren't just trying to get good at something so they can quit a job they hate and, you know, live in the beach. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and I think you can see in the development of, a, of your own brand with the art of term, you said if people go back and listen to the earlier episodes, they can say, oh, wow, look at the development over time. Now here you are, what, like 10 years in, yeah. and you're sitting at the top of the heap, and people can people can tell when they hear you. They know that you are well experienced and, and well versed in the craft, and it is just a function of continuing to work it and working it regularly. Um, as we start to wrap up, I really appreciate you coming on, Jordan. This has been an exciting yeah, interview. And for everybody that's watching, you know, we did zero prep. So, you know, this format can be one where it's just entirely in the moment and we see where the conversation takes us. And that's something you should have in your mind as an expectation when you go on some of these shows, especially if you have somebody as cagey as Jordan, who's, you know, punching and sort of jabbing you a little bit. If yep. you start to uh, stick, to, to stick to the script too, uh, too firmly. You, you, well, you know me. I, I challenge people, for the, again, for the good of the audience. Anything where I think somebody would call BS, I have to do it. And you've got to be prepared for that. You should be the type of guest that welcomes that type of challenge and doesn't get flustered by it. When you are able to do that, then you're starting to get ready for the big time. That's for sure. Because that's the mark of somebody who knows their content so well that when other people poke holes in it, they can immediately figure out where that hole is and why it's not actually a hole. Or you have to fix that hole. You have to go back and, and put a plug in your content. And that happens a lot too. You don't want that happening live on a radio show. That's super embarrassing. Yeah. And I mean, of course, we're doing a live broadcast now. So if you know if I, if I screw up or if something happens, oh, man. Yeah, take it back. And I'm not going to be like, hey, let's start this over. Everybody come back tomorrow at the same time and we'll do this all over again. Um, but I digress. So, you know, as we, as we wrap up this power packed hour, do you have any final words of inspiration, wisdom, or guidance for the authors that are coming up in the game out there based on talking to pretty much almost all of the best, you know, authors out there in the world on your show and any parting words? Sure. I mean, for me, what I've noticed is that everybody's in this for years and years and years before things really tend to pop off. And that's great because again, what it means is all you have to do is get really good at sticking it out and you have to get really good at delivering the content and it doesn't have to be the same content. You can pivot, you can move around. So anything you do right now is sort of preparing you for the next level and the next stage. And I think you've got a lot of groups of beginner intermediate type folks, authors here that are really ready to take their brand to the next level. And that's great because there's so much room for doing that well and noticing how many people are not doing it well. There's such a great area and there's such a great demand for people who are doing it well and delivering content in a professional way. So you are doing the right thing just by being in seminars like this where you're learning how to do it right instead of just freaking cold emailing me a PDF of your book and asking when we can schedule. That's not going to work. You have a huge leg up just knowing what we talked about today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jordan, for coming on. Everybody, yeah. you've gotten a taste of the host of The Art of Charm. If you want more of that, go subscribe to the Art of Charm podcast. <laughs> Anything else you want to share in terms of you know what you've got coming up next, or um, or just get people listening to the show? Sure. Yeah. I mean, look, I, people know how to listen to podcasts. It's a pretty tech savvy audience. I'm sure they have podcast apps and I, iTunes and things like that. So check it out. But also, you know, people can email me. I'm Jordan at theartofcharm.com. Takes me a while to get back, but I do get back. So if people have questions about things, I'm pretty decent about getting back to show fans. So, so hit me up. I'm, I'm not, don't be a stranger, I guess, is the, the idiom I was looking for. I love that. After, after a whole hour of saying, you know, how, how difficult and how, um, how prepared you have to be, 
the man gives out his personal email address. Yeah. I think it's a testament to the kind of guy you are. And well, it, do, it doesn't mean you have to you have to prepare a lot to come on the show. You don't have to prepare to email me that part. That, that let me know when I get to the part where you know you need to be prepared to email me and then just punch <laughs> me directly in the face at that point. That's just ridiculous. I think that's a great place to leave it off. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan, so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this interview on the Book, Business, and Brand Building Summit. I hope you're getting a ton of value out of this. I'm having a good time, and, uh, and it looks like from the chat that people are loving this as well. We'll see you on the next interview. Thanks, and bye for now.